everyone and a special welcome to anyone tuning in from the West Coast. I know it's a little bit early, so we all appreciate you being here and supporting us. Um, so today, today I will take you through the journey of the big leaf maples um, in Metro Vancouver and explore the question, are Eastern gray squirrels a big problem for big leaf maples? So big leaf maple is one of the few hardwood species on the Pacific coast of Canada. They span the Western coast in Washington, Oregon, and California, and in the province of British Columbia. Big leaf maples are an important uh, species ecologically, culturally, and economically. They support a large variety of species, um, are known as the paddle tree in several First Nations languages, and commercially they're used to construct musical instruments and veneers, among many other items. While these trees are uh, uh, valuable in so many ways, there is a concern in the Pacific Northwest that they are declining. The cause of the decline remains unclear and has been noticed throughout its range for about the last 10 years. Big leaf maple decline has been monitored and studied in Washington, Oregon, and California. In the United States, they're seeing a variety of symptoms that indicate tree decline. So symptoms such as partial to entire crown dieback, uh, reduced leaf size and yellow flagging, um, and dieback of entire branches, suggested root disease. So forest professionals tested for and ruled out several biotic agents, which I've listed here for you. A recently published study in Western Washington concluded that it is most likely linked to abiotic agents of road proximity, increased land development, and escalating temperatures over the summer. In BC, however, Metro Vancouver Regional Parks forest health reports completed in 2019 and 2020 reported big leaf maple flagging and attributed some of it to squirrel damage. However, it was uncertain of other flagging. British Columbia has invasive Eastern gray squirrels and these squirrels are known to damage a substantial amount of forest in the United Kingdom. Also, Crutchmeria doista, a fungal pathogen has recently been investigated in Metro Vancouver. Additionally, many trees in Metro Vancouver Regional Parks are also becoming older and could be seeing age-related decline. So my objectives are, one, to discern is there a decline syndrome in Metro Vancouver Regional Parks, and two, what may be causing it? So my hypotheses are as follows. Age-related patterns are a driving factor in Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. Bark stripping will show a positive correlation to decline and Kretschmeri will also be positively correlated with decline. So over 10 days in September 2021, I visited seven Metro Vancouver regional parks across the district. The parks marked with yellow dots are parks that the Metro Vancouver Forest Health uh, Report identified as having big leaf maple flagging, and the purple dots are the parks that I gathered data from. So trails were walked in these parks, and trees were sampled semi-randomly up to a maximum of 10 meters off of the trail. Data were collected for a total of 122 trees, 20 trees per park, with the exception of one park where only two trees were found uh, due to time constraints. So data were recorded for GPS location, DBH, and several crown health metrics that I've listed here. Information was also gathered for the presence or absence of foliar diseases, fruiting bodies, damage, and leaf tip dieback. The presence or absence of flagging was also recorded. Flagging in this study is defined as the presence of clusters on leaves on the same branch showing wilting and or chlorosis with clusters affecting greater than 10% of the canopy. To statistically analyze the data, our studio was used to first run a general linear regression model and then a direct ordination using correspondence analysis. Regression was used to determine statistical significance of flagging as a function of DBH, bark stripping, Kretschmeria doista, and leaf tip dieback. Correspondence analysis helped identify if there were signs and symptoms that are potentially co-occurring. So all parks exhibited flagging, as we can see here from the blue bars, but not all parks showed bark stripping and Kretschmeria doista, which is represented by the orange and gray bars. Only two parks were found to have both bark stripping and Kretschmeria, which were Pacific Spirit Park and Burnaby Lake Regional Park. 20 stems were identified to have flagging. Bark stripping damage was found exclusively in the canopy and accounted for 12 stems of the trees. And in 12 stems were infected with Kretschmeria doista. Trees with bark stripping and Kretschmeria were found on separate trees, with the exception of one tree um, that was found to have both Kretschmeria and bark stripping. Some trees were also found to have leaf tip dieback, tar spot, 
and powdery mildew. So general linear modeling found bark stripping, DBH, and Krechmeria, and the interaction between bark stripping and DBH to be significant. To patterns of signs and symptoms that may be co-occurring, canonical correspondence analysis, a direct ordination was employed. So the canonical axes tested several signs and symptoms, which I've listed here. Highest weightings in the CCA1 associated with leaf lagging were Nectria cinnabarina, bark stripping, and Krechmeri doista, shown at the bottom of the plot. There was also a strong associ association on CA access one seen on the left of the plot, but it was not as strong as the first access. So Kretschmeria doista, other damage in DBH were the highest weightings on CA1. While Nectria cinnabarina technically had the highest weighting on the first axis, there's only a few samples with this fungus. So this result may be unstable. This plot here shows the distribution of trees and trees to the left are considered to be in good condition and trees to the right are to be in poor condition. So the yellow dot shows uh, trees with flagging, which is associated with declining tree health conditions. So this plot shows bark stripping with yellow dots. As you can see here, again, good condition to the left and poor condition to the right. Uh, trees affected by bark stripping are also more towards the right and are associated with diminishing tree health. And similarly, this plot shows Krechmeria with yellow dots. So as you can see here again, this one as well, again, good condition is to the left and poor condition is to the right. Uh, trees affected by Krechmeria are associated with both deteriorating tree health and also with larger diameter trees. So bark stripping was found to have a strong association to declining tree health. While I did not witness any specific animal causing damage, Based on the bark stripping characteristics, its location on the tree canopy and with big leaf maples affected, some conclusions can be drawn of which animal is most likely responsible for this damage. So based off of the location of bark stripping found in the canopy, we can rule out several animals known to bark strip in Metro Vancouver. So American black bears, American beaver, and various rabbit species are all, are all found in Metro Vancouver and are associated with bark stripping. However, their damage is limited to the lower trunk of the trees, as you can see with this rabbit here. So we can rule out these animals. But there are three more species we should consider. These three are associated with bark stripping in the canopy. So the North American porcupine is native to the region. They tend to leave long distinctive chisel marks though, about five millimeters in width, larger than the bark stripping found in this study. Also, they're associated with conifers and have been extirpated from Vancouver. So they are an unlikely contender. Next on the list is our Douglas squirrel, another native species to the area. Douglas squirrels, however, are associated with conifers. Studies have found pine cambium in their stomach contents, and they have also been known to chew the tips and shoots of red fir and Douglas fir. Metro Vancouver park staff have also observed them bark stripping Western red cedar. Since we are examining big leaf maples, they too are an unlikely suspect. So that leaves our final suspect, the introduced Eastern gray squirrel. They are associated with bark stripping in the canopy of hardwoods, globally with numerous studies done on their damage to forests. So the Eastern gray squirrels are associated with hardwood forests, usually oak, oak hickory, and beech maple forests in the United States and parts of, um, sorry, in the United Kingdom and parts of the United States. Eastern gray squirrels have been associated with bark stripping maples, as well as many other hardwood species. The United Kingdom in particular has seen substantial to their damage, uh, substantial damage to their forests as a result of Eastern gray squirrels. And they evaluate that the approximate cost of gray squirrel uh, tree damage in England and Wales to be at least 37 million pounds a year in lost timber value, reduced carbon capture, damage mitigation, and tree replacement planting for those trees that they've lost to gray bark stripping. This behavior, along with others in their introduced settings, have earned eastern gray squirrels the reputation of being invasive in some parts of the world. And since their preferred species of attack and recognized damage of the hardwood forests, it makes them our most likely culprit for the bark stripping in Metro Vancouver. So the province of BC has deemed the eastern gray squirrel as invasive. And there are concerns on Vancouver Island that these gray squirrels are neg negatively affecting the Gary Oak ecosystem, but the BC SPCA questions this label and states that they're being used as a scapegoat. 
But what's interesting is that there's actually few studies published um, in BC that find Eastern gray squirrels and are not having a negative impact on native squirrel populations. And it does not appear that there are studies examining their impacts on forests in BC either. And in, but in the United Kingdom, however, there have been multiple studies showing the negative effects of Eastern gray squirrels on the native red squirrel population, as well as causing substantial damage to forests. My study likewise found that Eastern gray squirrels are most likely responsible for bark stripping, causing big leaf maple flagging, and indeed are harming their habitat. So bark stripping can be showing a concern for Eastern gray squirrel behavior. Um, in Metro, the Metro Vancouver Health Report associated 20 hectares of big leaf maple flagging to squirrel damage due to bark stripping at Campbell Valley Regional Park. Um, this is currently about 3% of the 548 hectares of the park, and this needs careful active monitoring to potentially uh, prevent similar impacts seen in the UK. So professionals in the UK report that in the span of seven to eight years, um, impacts of damage can span 30 to upwards of 80% damage. Um, so this study found that all DBH classes were affected, with DBH is 25 to 43, and greater than 80 being the most affected. This could be a combination of vitality in trees, um, with younger trees being attacked, and possibly older trees producing more seed, potentially attracting more squirrels. A recent study released in 2016 states the calcium hypothesis, highlighting that higher levels of calcium in certain uh, tree species, such as maples, um, cu coupled with lactating squirrels may be the cause of um, elevated bark stripping. Damage and death of younger trees can substantially damage the regeneration of forests, so this is a cause for concern. So at this point, um, the most effective tool will be monitoring and data collection on bark stripping to gauge the impacts. The UK has used several management techniques in the past, such as culling that eventually led to the return of squirrel pie to the menu, as you can see in the picture. They're also researching an immunocontraceptive um, to be administered by food. And this is intended for population control as a potential non-lethal, low labor intensive and cost-effective management method. Shuttleworth et al. also found that using volunteer-based approach methods with the support of government for monitoring and control can be an effective management strategy. Kretschmeri Doista was also found to have strong associations to deteriorating tree health. This soft rot in the Acemomycota phylum affects trees by deteriorating their cellulose and lignin. And as it parasitizes the trunks and roots, strength is lost quickly as the cellulose breaks down. This can make trees vulnerable to sudden tree failure and limb loss with, student, with studies from Europe uh, showing that it can become a potential hazard for urban areas and parks. So Kretschmeri also, so, also showed strong associations with diameter, which may indicate age-related decline um, as only larger trees over 61 dBH were affected. This is, however, little, um, there is, however, little data available on Kretschmeri and BC, and provincial mycologists state that there's a concern and that it's an important fungus to monitor and needs more research. Um, there is research into the use of trichoderma, which is a surface mold, um, to stop the continual growth of the fungus. Um, but collecting data and monitoring the extent of Kretschmeria along heavily used trails would be important. Um, leaf tip dieback did not show associations to big leaf maple flagging, however, um, it was found in Pacific Spirit Park, um, but, there, but they weren't able to ascertain as to why it might be there. Um, Betson et al. stated that their findings found a strong correlation between land development and big leaf maple decline. So this could be a potential explanation um, for some of the leaf tip dieback that's happening at Pacific Spirit Park, as well as other parks within Metro Vancouver. So as Metro Vancouver continues to develop their land, this would be something important to continue to monitor. Sooty bark disease is something that is new um, on the horizon recently. While it is common in the Northeast of North America, it is something new to the Pacific Northwest and they've identified in Washington, but it's unknown in BC at this time. Um, this is something to be aware of because it might not only be, it, it isn't only a potential risk to trees, it's definitely um, a potential risk to humans um, for people who work in the industry and it causes adverse health effects. So this needs to continue to be monitored. So in conclusion, bark stripping was found to have strong associations to diminishing tree health and big leaf maples, and eastern gray squirrels are our most likely culprit. Kretschmeri doista also has strong associations to deteriorating tree health and larger diameter trees. 
um, and also needs active monitoring. So as such, I would recommend initiating a volunteer-based bark stripping monitoring program in Campbell Valley Regional Park, identifying and monitoring decline in infected Kretschmeri doista along heavily um, used trails, keeping an eye out for sooty bark disease and collaborating with different organizations within the district and province, such as the BCSPCA, to create a cohesive message and approach to Eastern gray squirrel management. Um, so to end this presentation, I'd like to acknowledge um, my supervisors, Professor Sean Thomas and Dave Shaw for all of their support, as well as the Metro Vancouver Park staff who've been um, assisting me and supporting me throughout this project. So thank you all for your time. Uh, Adrian. Is that coming through back there? Well, there we are. Uh, David Shaw, you're on the line. Do you have some questions for Adrian? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Adrian, that was a really nice presentation. And um, it's uh, really all new information, I guess, from the report. It wasn't all new to the Vancouver people, but it's really nice to see this done. Um, could you expound a little more on the differences between your findings and the Washington finding, um, you know, the, the folks in Washington just came out with that paper that you showed. And um, how was, how are your findings really different from that finding uh, more explicitly? Because that's, everybody is sort of fallen onto that paper as the, the key to what we're seeing down south in Big Leaf Maple, but it seems like things are a little different um, in your area. Yeah, so um, the paper that came out in September 2021, um, it found that the most likely cause is abiotic agents of road proximity, increased land development and escalating temperatures. And the study um, looked at many different aspects of what could potentially be affecting it. They gathered soil samples. So there was a lot of detail put into that report. However, that was in Washington. Um, what we're seeing in BC though, through the Metro Vancouver, um, data collection is that um, we're finding biotic agents of bark stripping um, through an eastern uh, eastern gray squirrels, as well as Kretschmeri doista, which is um, a fungal pathogen. So, while while certain aspects of that paper could be affecting Vancouver, um, we're seeing strong um, we're seeing strong um, Sorry, uh, Vancouver is seeing more of uh, biotic agents working um, at uh, deteriorating tree health in big leaf maples. Yeah, that, I, that's quite interesting. And um, the, the connection with the squirrel is particularly interesting. Um, in, and to the south here, you know, we have a native squirrel that is also known to bark strip uh, big leaf maple and it can be a problem. Um, I, I um, like the monitoring uh, uh, suggestions that you're taking and these, is there, um, can you imagine other ways to monitor that wouldn't necessarily strictly involve um, uh, people uh, in the sense of, um, could you monitor um, with other techniques, um, other than just people walking around looking at things, um, can you imagine some different ways of monitoring? Um, so the volunteer-based um, bark stripping program could potentially be a useful management tool, but um, we definitely talked about, um, we talked about wildlife cameras that could be um, a potential uh, way to to see which areas maybe are 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 seeing more or less bark stripping in that sense. Um, iNaturalist also seems to be quite an effective tool um, that can employ citizen science. So it, I guess it, my understanding with iNaturalist is it's more regarding species, but I think if the community was more involved and um, organizations had a more of a cohesive approach to Eastern Gray Squirrel management, um, because right now the BCSPC is kind of questioning even the label of being invasive. So I think if there was a bit more of a cohesive um, messaging across the province and in the district, um, 
it could inform the public as well about the potential negative effects on forests and therefore in turn on potentially wildlife as well. If our forests are damaged, then that could have a cascading effect on our wildlife. And so if we have this cohesive message and the public knows, then they could potentially use things like iNaturalist and other, um, and other apps like this to at least collect the information, the data to get a bigger picture of just how much damage there actually is happening in Vancouver. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I, th I think the wildlife cameras also could be particularly important in, you know, proving that the, you know, because some people may still be skeptical about mm -hmm. the squirrels actually doing the damage. And if you had some wildlife observations on camera, then that could really support the monitoring, you know, other monitoring um, approaches. So very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, David. Uh, Sean has a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, Dave. Um, uh, <laughs> hey, Sean. <laughs> uh, Eastern gray squirrels invasive also in um, kind of urban and peri-urban areas in Oregon and Washington. And uh, uh, so I wonder if you've seen any, uh, they're particularly in uh, kind of Seattle through Olympia, they're in Spokane, they're in... Uh, uh, Vancouver, Washington. I think they're in Portland. Uh, yes. Is there any reports at all of, of damage in those areas or are people looking? Yeah, that's interesting you say that. I don't think they're looking, to be honest. I haven't seen any reports um, of tree damage from uh, squirrels. There may be, because the western gray squirrel is also native down south here, um, there may be confusion about which squirrels, you know, in terms of just observations people have. So we haven't seen the explicit uh, distinction that I'm aware of. I know they're considered a nuance um, in many of the cities, but I haven't heard uh, or seen anything published on their foraging. So I think that's another reason this British Columbia work is uh, really important. And, and Adrian, did you did you come across any any anything else, you know else in North America of, of these guys really being a problem? Um, I think they do have a problem with it in Cincinnati, and I think the province at this point, their approach to management for eastern gray squirrels is just preventing the spread of eastern gray squirrels into the rest of the province. Because I think at this point, you see we have it on Vancouver Island and we have it in Metro Vancouver and. We're knowing that there is more of a population now in Kelowna, but I'm not, I don't think they're in the, the north of the province at this point. And so I think they're trying to avoid that. But I, I think, yeah, from what I came across, I think it's Cincinnati, they have a substantial amount of damage done there as well. And, and, and also, how do, you, how do you put out the, the oral contraceptives? Is, are these nuts or? Uh... So the UK is currently doing research into that actually at the moment. Um, they want to have it administered by food. So I think they're looking into like a, um, like a not a trap, but like a special um, box kind of a system where they would put the food in and they would ensure that this, this box can only be accessible by Eastern gray squirrels, but they're, they're in the process of figuring out which, um, type of tool would be the best for that at this point in time. In Washington, I believe they, they have tested an immunocontraceptive that they use through injection. Um, but that was, I think that was a few years ago when they did that study and they found that to be effective, but they also found that it did have some effects on like the body scores and created some abs abscesses, sorry, like lesions on the squirrels. Um, so I think that, like that might cause a bit of concern for some people or maybe like worried about animal welfare. So I think that's why the UK is maybe looking into using food, but that's, they're currently in the research process of that. So there's no really, I didn't come across any actual results of what they've landed on at this point. <laughs> that's great, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have time for any further questions for this presentation, but you can add your comments to the chat and we'll all have the opportunity to read through those and uh, stimulate other discussions later on. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much.